Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our sixth annual uh, Andrew Hilton beer tasting. I say annual, but we do it weekly, so I don't know why I said annual. Uh, this week we are doing wheat beers, and we're doing a very specific style of wheat beers. We're mostly doing kind of Belgian and German style wheat beers, and within that we're not doing sours. Could we classify Berliner Weiss as a wheat beer? Yes. Could we classify Landeck as a wheat beer? Absolutely. But when you say the words wheat beer, those aren't the very first things that come to your mind. You think about Belgian wits, you think about Hefeweizens, or if you're really feeling like a fancy lad, you think about Dunkelweizens. Um, and for that, this is a topic where we get very deep into the history, and this is a topic where we get really into the technical nitty-gritty, which, as I have learned over these six uh, weeks, you really love getting into. So uh, joining this week is a uh, former Lethbridge resident and uh, BJCP National Certified Beer Judge, Mark Whitehead. Hello, Mark. Hi, Kyle. How's it going? I'm doing great. Uh, welcome, and thank you again for doing this. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I'm glad that the beers got to you okay, because uh, I was a little worried, that, you know, throwing them in the, uh, in the post, but they all made it, so that's good. Uh, at least they're cans. Yeah, there we go. Uh, next week we actually have our first ever bottle. We got a lambic next week, but we'll get to oh, talk about that. Uh, so, Mark, you're a you're a person who you know talks about beer and thinks about beer on a level that I can't even compare compare with. Um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about Hefeweizen and Wit? We'll leave the Dunkelweizen to one side for the minute, but as we get into this first beer, uh, why don't you talk us through the difference between a Wit and a Hefe? 
Well, uh, it's largely the uh, country of origin and some key ingredient differences. So uh, Bavarian Hefeweizen is uh, from Bavaria, Germany, obviously. And uh, this being a wit beer would be a Belgian-style wit beer. So there's going to be some differences in yeast characteristics, but the biggest difference is usually in a Belgian wit beer, they have uh, the addition of orange peel and coriander. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little later, why the, the Bavarians wouldn't put that in their beer. But it uh, adds a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of bitterness and a little fruit characteristic that uh, you find in the Belgian version. Now, I know because we talked about this uh, before the tasting started, but you really moved away at the wrong time. You haven't had anything from Cabin or 88 or probably not even establishment yet. Uh, you really picked a hell of a time to move out of Alberta there, Mark. That's correct, yeah. Uh, the BC beer culture has kind of been stable for a little while. There's some exciting stuff going on out here, but uh, to hear to hear everything that's going on with these new breweries in, in uh, Calgary is, is and some in Edmonton too is, is quite exciting. Uh, former home brewers and, and beer judges are, are starting these breweries and, and they really know their stuff. They're quite passionate about it. Do you know any of the guys who started any of these breweries just from homebrew competitions or judging or any of that? I do actually. Mike Foniak and uh, uh, Brandon from uh, Establishment. Mike Foniak was the competition director for the Calgary uh, Calgary Eastmit Wranglers for many years. He came down and judged in our Lethbridge competition quite a few times. So he and I got to be pretty good friends. Uh, beer brings everyone together, doesn't it? It sure tends to. Uh, we have our first question. Grant asks, uh, why did you move to Cranbrook? Was it for the beer? Uh, not really, no. It was for, uh, for employment opportunity. Uh, I'm the assistant superintendent at Wildstone Golf Course, which you can see behind me here. And I uh, was just looking for uh, an opportunity to, to get out here in the Kootenays where there's a ton of, ton of stuff to do outdoors and, and a beautiful golf course uh, brought me out here. Wonderful. Now, when we talk about uh, 88, we usually end up talking about their, their big dry hop stuff, whether it's a night gallery or wave pool or ring pop um, or double dare or fruity pebbles. Basically, 90% of what they make these days seems like IPAs. But when I went there for the first time and I sat down at the bar and, you know, I sat in their absolutely incredibly neon everything 80s themed tap room and I got served my first like sampler board, the beer that really blew me away the very first time uh, was actually this hologram wheat. Um, and I've always been very sad that this beer doesn't sell better because I think it's in its category the best thing going. Um, and yet wheat beers kind of end up being pushed to the side. Are they too tart? Are they not hoppy enough? Um, I know you're not in the, the retail side of this, Mark, but I'm sure you see this as well. Why do you think it is that people aren't all about the wheat beer to the point where they are all about the IPA or very recently all about the sour? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I suppose that uh, wheat beers tend to be, like you say, pushed to the side uh, for folks who perhaps are just being introduced to beer. So. Uh, in craft brewing, it seems like the big tendency is to push for the next bigger, better uh, thing. And, you know, how many more hops can we put in an IPA or, or what can we do that will out, outpace the, the competition? So these classic easy drinking wheat beers, uh, which I find are, are, you know, there's a definite time and a place for, for easy drinking beers like these. Uh, it's easy for, for them to be overlooked sometimes in the market. Well, you know, I kind of picked this because I was looking at the weather outside at the time and it was just heating up. I think it was 23 above when I said, yeah, we're going to do wheat ale at the tail end of March. It's going to be, or at the tail end of May, it's going to be warm and sunny and bright and people are going to be out on their patios and it's absolutely pounded rain all day. It's exactly the opposite sort of day where you want to be drinking wheat beers. So that kind of screwed up, but we're doing these about two and a half weeks out. So, you know, you, you live, you learn sometimes. Uh, let's talk about the, the beer in our glass here, Mark. Uh, I, I know what I get out of it. Why don't you walk us through it? Well, I'm getting a lot of the characteristics I would find classic in a Belgian-style wheat beer. So I'm, I'm really tasting that coriander and that bitter orange peel. Uh, you would think that you would get uh, the orange flavor from the orange peel, and you would get the bitterness from the coriander, but it's not very well known that that's actually the opposite. You, you get the bitterness from the orange peel, and the orange flavor comes from the coriander seeds. So I'm definitely getting those two in spades. 
and they are uh, they're complemented very well with the with the citrus hoppiness that might be a bit higher than you'd find in a classic Belgian variety, but this is a great uh, American craft style, I suppose Canadian craft take on the style. Well, having had most of the 88 stuff, I don't think there's anything they don't look at least somewhat askance if it's not hoppy. They, they make some really cool dark beers, but um, let's be fair, hops are what they're best known for, I think, uh, in terms of their non-incredibly dark beers. And this is just very bright and fresh and immediately approachable. And I find for a lot of um, wheat beers, not so much now, but going back maybe 10 years ago to perhaps the, the very bad old days of the Alberta craft beer scene, a lot of wheat beers finish with this very aggressively tart, kind of almost sour finish in the back of the throat that I think turned a lot of people off of these styles. This, I think, because it finishes bitter rather than sour, remains refreshing or remains balanced. And it actually fills the point of why I think people drink wheat beer, which is just keep coming back for another glass and another glass and another glass. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm enjoying it here on a, on a cool and, and cloudy day, but uh, in a, on a summer patio, this would be ideal for quenching thirst. The citrus aspect of, uh, once again, both the coriander and the uh, the hops are playing very nice together. And, and just like you say, it's uh, it leads you into the next sip for sure very well. Now, wheat is not the easiest uh, ingredient to brew with. We've all dealt with the absolute afternoon ruining experience of a stuck mash. Um, why don't you talk about a little bit as a, as a brewer for the experience of brewing with wheat, what you look for, what you don't, and what you absolutely never want to do? Well, that's, yeah, that's, uh, there's some good points there. Obviously, uh, wheat, uh, you would expect, well, if it's a wheat beer, it's made with wheat, but usually it's about 50% wheat and the rest is made up of barley. Uh, if you just use straight wheat malt, uh, you would have, as you mentioned, a stuck gummy mass uh, in your mash tun that leads to uh, an afternoon wrecking brewing session. So uh, that said, it's usually about 50% wheat, some will be 60%, and it's a very high protein malt. So as a result, you tend to get haze that comes through in the finished beer. We're all familiar with the cloudy Hefeweizen and uh, cloudy wit beer. And also uh, you get a really dense, uh, foamy, long lasting head because of the extra protein in the grain. But uh, yeah, other than uh, just not adding too much wheat, you can also add some rice hulls to try and help the uh, the grain bed drain a little better. But but uh, we certainly want to avoid a stuck mash when you're brewing, that's for sure. Now, of course, Belgian wit isn't the only wheat beer style that comes from Belgium. Um, triples, of course, are very often wheat-based. In fact, I think they're universally wheat-based. Uh, and then you also have a lot of saisons will have wheat, or almost universally, again, will have wheat. Um, do you want to talk just in brief, before we get to the Hefeweizens, kind of about the other Belgian styles that involve the use of wheat and why they're a little different from uh, Belgian wit? Sure. Uh, the Belgian wit is uh, tends to be a lower alcohol, more refreshing type beer, of course, triple is uh t pushes you know eight ten percent sometimes uh so it's a a beer that they'll also usually add a little bit of candy sugar to to boost the gravity and use a yeast that throws off quite a bit more phenol in that it's fermenting to a to a higher percentage of alcohol uh saison is is kind of a style where they they sort of put a little bit of everything in there so not just wheat but basically anything that uh they had thought to add uh, over the years has, has been added to a saison, all different kinds of grains and spices. Uh, specifically, when we move over to, to the German beers, that's something the Germans uh, would add, definitely abhor is putting uh, any kind of anything other than grain, water, and yeast into the beer. But the Belgians have certainly never been scared over the years to try uh, putting a little bit of this and a little bit of that, hence the coriander, the orange peel and uh, the candy sugars and the other spices you might find in a triple and a saison. Beautiful. Well, let's take that as our uh, jump into the very traditional Bavarian wheat. So we have the uh, the Polliner Hefeweiss beer. Um, probably the, the Hefeweizen I'm most familiar with. I mean, Schneider I'm very familiar with as well. And to be honest, the one I probably take home the most is the Hacker's Shore. But Polliner is the one that comes in six packs. It's the one that you see more often than not on draft. Um, it's also the least expensive. I think these cans run the princely sum of like two ninety five on the shelf. Um, very, cool. very pretty, interesting, punchy, and just the beautiful, beautiful color on this beer. That bright orange with the nice thick head. This is one of those beers that I don't buy very often. I don't bring home very often, but 
I'm always reminded just how much I like this style. Yeah, it's classic style for sure. Uh, the Bavarians drink it for breakfast over there. Um, now, there's there's quite a bit of difference between these two in that there is there is no coriander or orange peel. And since the Germans began, there's the, the Bavarian purity law of 1516 where uh, the king at the time, uh, I'm not sure it might have been King Ludwig, uh, name escapes me, but decided that... Uh, they had to stop putting a little bit of this and a little bit of that in the beer because, of course, hops were expensive. So if they could find some kind of other herb to bitter the beer with, then it would save the cost. And uh, he made a decision that that, that was going to be against the law. And they've kind of ran with that ever since. So uh, the, the Bavarian Purity Law states that beer can only contain barley, uh, water, and hops. And then, of course, wheat beer, they add wheat to that. Uh, they didn't know about yeast at the time, so yeast wasn't included in 1516. But uh, generally, that's included nowadays. So, what one would hope, yes. Um, <clears throat> so, when we talk about Hefeweizen, we're talking kind of like yeast wheat, um, and the yeast. You know, all beer ultimately is fermented with the yeast, but in this beer, it, it's particularly important because that's where you get that banana and clove and everything else. When we were talking about the wit here, you were talking about well, the, the citrus gives you the bitterness, and the coriander gives you the the orangey note. With this, all of these banana and clove notes that we're getting, there's no banana or cloves added. There's no brewer's tricks. It's just coming from the yeast. Absolutely. So it's a very specific strain, and uh, it's usually used in the Dunkel Ice as well. Uh, it ferments and throws off these yeast byproducts, uh, specifically uh, clovey phenols and banana esters. Uh, so the clovey phenol that you get is uh, for vinyl guaiacol. It kind of gives that spicy, peppery, bordering on rubbery, medicinal, but, but clovey sort of flavor. And uh, the, the banana flavor is uh, isoamyl acetate. It's the same kind of chemical you might find in banana runts or banana flavored candies. So once again, yeah, there are no cloves or banana in this, but uh, the very best Hefeweizens have a, have a nice balance and it's fairly prominent uh, of those two aspects. And yes, yeah, absolutely, it's derived from the yeast. I think that's kind of funny. That's one of those chemical compounds that occurs naturally in this beer to give you that banana character, but it's also the same chemical that we associate with being, you know, artificial banana in candies and things. Reminds me of diacetyl in beer, in my case, usually with wine. Um, diacetyl in, a, in an alcoholic product really throws this almost off-putting, like, margarine character to you. And I've not been to Germany, no. no? Oh. I have not. Oh, neither have I. Terrible tragedy, really. It really is, isn't it? Well, that just throws my next couple of minutes of questions right out the window because I swore you'd been in Germany. So, all right, we're just going to wing this damn thing. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, in terms of uh, German wheat beers, we talked about the other styles with Belgium, but, of course, there are the, uh, a couple of other German styles that use uh, wheat beer. We're going to talk about Berliner Weiss um, quite a bit more next week when we cover sours. Um, but do you want to talk about Berliner Weiss just a little bit here? Yeah, sure. So, Berliner Weiss... Uh it, traditionally, I mean, there's there's many different ways it's brewed nowadays, but traditionally it was a very, very low alcohol, and oftentimes uh, there wasn't even a boil used. Sometimes they would hop directly into the mash and uh, ferment the wort without boiling it. So the lactobacillus that was present on the grain uh, would, would instantly cause uh, lactic acid production, and it ends up being quite a sour thing. Uh, over there in Berlin, I believe, having not been there, but I, I, I believe they often serve it with uh, flavored fruit syrups. So it's a very low alcohol, once again, about 3% beer, but it's often served, uh, you know, with different fruit syrups. And uh, uh, you can choose at point of service uh, what you'd like to sweeten it with. So it's, all, it's almost like... Um... I know that Rattler can be served that way as well with the various fruit service, uh, fruit syrups, but that seems much less interesting than doing it with Berliner Weiss because Berliner Weiss is just so so fresh and pretty and just so snappy. Um, we've had an absolute explosion of sours here over the last, say, year and especially over the last six months where really and truly if I don't have a new sour every week, people are like, well, why don't you have a new sour? What's wrong with you? 
And it, it's kind of funny, I, I literally went through every single listing. I, I went to Connect, I clicked on everything brewed in Alberta, everything in cans, everything in stock, and I just went through every single beer, all 445 of them alphabetically, just to find something new this week. Because the beer category right now is so red hot that I ordered, I think, $25,000, $30,000 on Monday, and I got about half of it. And most of that was beer just because everything is sold out. It's amazing how hot the market is. I suppose if everyone's uh, been staying home and, and less likely to go out to uh, restaurants, which of course haven't been open, uh, certainly uh, the the home market for beer sales has probably been off the charts uh, across the country. I would imagine it's been a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's jump over to the next. Let's go into the rise and shine here. Now this is a a little bit of an atypical Hefeweizen in some ways. Um, dry hopped pretty aggressively. They use Sabro hops on this, uh, and they're really looking to bring out, I think, the, the bright pineapple characters on this. When I very first had this last year with the batch one, I said this, this tastes like dull whip to me. It tastes like a pineapple smoothie uh, more than anything else. This is using uh, the same traditional kind of estery, clovey, banana yeast that they use on the polliner, but I don't get very much of that. I find it very much in the background. Uh, and Todd, yeah, polliner for breakfast sounds uh, really, really good. Uh, and the Germans actually have it for second breakfast. Like most things in Germany, they have a word for that. I forget exactly what it is, but they actually have a second breakfast, which is kind of like cold cuts and bread in like a, a Hefeweizen, which is a lot of fun. Uh, what's the etymology of the different Weizens? Okay, um, I can quickly get to that. Uh, Hefeweizen, so yeast wheat, Dunkelweizen, dark wheat, Berliner Weiss, Wheat beer from Berlin. Um, not thinking of another one that actually ends in Weizen right now. There's Crystal Weizen, which you don't see very often, which is like clarified wheat or clear wheat, um, which is basically this idea, but run through it a pretty aggressive filter. I don't like that stock, so I think it strips the beer out too much. It it leaves it very dull, in my opinion. Mark, can you think of a couple others? Uh, just Weis Weizenbach uh, comes hmm. to mind. Uh, so Bach brewed with wheat. The Germans are pretty categorical in their naming. Uh, they don't mess around. It's it's dark wheat. It's yeast wheat. It's Berliner Weiss. You know you know exactly what you're getting when you, when the Germans name a beer. Yeah, we we covered this a little bit when we did the the German wine tasting about how you could almost use a German wine label as a GPS to get to within like a hundred yards of where the the wine was actually sourced from. German beer labels are very much the same way. Where yeah, they're, they're going to tell you what's in it. This example, you know, they tell you it's a it's a Hefeweizen. They don't mention that it's an aggressively dry hopped Hefeweizen that's you know made in Calgary that it's you know really really crazy wild. Um, they just call it a Hefeweizen. The Germans would be you know looking down their noses at that a bit, but I don't care what the Germans think because this stuff rocks. Let's get into it. Yeah, oh, yeah fair enough. Is, it's this is just my style right there. It's it's a New England Hefeweizen, and I love it so much for that. Um, when you have this at cabin, you're like, oh, wow, cabin, where's the hops? You have this after super saturation or sunshine rain in it. It doesn't seem hoppy. But coming after the hologram and coming after the polliner, this, this jumps out at you like an IPA, which, again, it's all about the, the beers around it. I it love does. It has a hop, a, a big hop bitterness and, and a, just a juicy, juicy hop character for sure. Oh, and there's the big pineapple I love. And there's mangoes in there as well. A little bit of something more tropical. Oh, this is just, this is my thing. There's definitely something to be said for drinking uh, something as a Hefeweizen-style beer closer to the point of production. Uh, it, it, they're usually uh, very fast-maturing beers that don't age very well, and they're usually drank very, very, very fresh. So uh, the Paul Anner is tasting great, but I can assure you that when it left the brewery, it probably had a little bit more by, uh, vitality to it. Um, of course, it had to come all the way across the pond, and uh, this to me is just, there's freshness just jumping out of the glass. Perhaps it's a little more hot than you might find in a traditional series. The judges might rip it apart for that, but uh, but it's it's really quite a, quite a great beer. Well, you know, beer judges are going to beer judge, and, you know, that's fine. They just hate creativity. <laughs> that there uh there's a definitely a movement in craft beer to reinvent the old and uh and some of the old world uh beer judges are are being dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century that's for sure 
Well, it's funny. We had Dave Ronneberg from Establishment on uh, a few weeks ago. And when we were talking about, you know, his sour and we were talking about his New Zealand pills and everything else, he kept going back and saying, well, this is kind of the, the BJCP style guide. And this is this is what we were aiming for. And some of their beers are the most like experimental and wild and crazy beers out there. But they're, they're very grounded in their roots and they're very grounded. In, this is what we are starting with. And if we want to go coloring a little outside the lines, we're, gonna get, we're not going to go too far out of the lines because that's how you end up with a mess. They're very cognizant of those classic styles and they know exactly where they're experimenting from there which i really appreciate yeah having never actually tasted any of establishments beers but having tasted a lot of their beers uh mike and brandon's anyways as home brewers uh definitely those guys won a ton of awards by doing the classic styles very very well and there's a reason why those styles have been you know uh the the mainstay of beer brewing for so long because they are uh, done so well and and so classic. But if you really understand the fundamentals, then uh, it gives you a great jumping off point to really explore and and uh, not end up with something that's that's undrinkable. Now speaking of, I know your uh, home brewing kit followed you out to Cranbrook from here. Uh, what are you brewing this year, Mark? What are you absolutely in love with that you've made this year? Uh, well, I brewed a few. Uh, I've, it's been an IPA heavy uh, year. Uh, most of the beers I've brewed have uh, found themselves with uh, pandemic related names like the pandemic pale ale I brewed. I'm absolutely in love with the uh, isolation IPA has been great. Uh, I've been experimenting with some new hops. I just generally order hops from uh, a couple suppliers in, in Washington and Oregon, uh, Hops Direct and, and Fresh Hops. And usually just end up ordering whatever's available. Uh, I've tried some new ones that I haven't tried before. Uh, Peco is one I'm really in love with for bittering. It's kind of a little bit more uh, spicy herbal, kind of like a old world saws style, but it's very high alpha acids, so hmm. the bitterness is unreal. Uh, I'm really in love with the, the shipment of cashmere that I got. haven't tried that hop before, but it's kind of like a Cascade Centennial uh beautiful beautiful character really really dank and resinous and uh so some of the beers that uh, have been pushing the limits of uh hoppiness for me have been some of my favorites this year are you on any wait lists for hops uh, one of the things we got into with uh, dave again from establishment a couple of weeks ago was um he made a beer called part-time model which was this new zealand pills that i absolutely loved and it was a huge hit at the beer tasting as well uh and we asked him hey when's this coming out again he's like yeah i'm on a four-year wait list to get that hop again uh are you struggling with the same thing are you on a wait list for half of your favorite hops well, not really. Uh, basically, I just uh, at the at the harvest season, I try to order fresh hops every year, and I just order whatever uh, whatever is available. Uh, I guess I don't really have to answer to shareholders, and I don't have to brew the same thing over and over again. So, just uh, buy what I can get and uh, smell it and see how it uh, smells, and then go from there. Brew some beer with it, see how it is. Now, I will say, I, I really appreciate this about Cabin. Um, if you look at Establishment and 88, which are you know two of, I think, the three best breweries in Alberta right now, um, what they're making is very immediate. It's sours, it's IPAs, it's, it's stars that people immediately want to drink. And don't get me wrong, like, 88's doing this Weed Ale, and uh, Establishment has their Mellow Gold, which, if you haven't had it, oh, dear God, that's a good Munich Hellas. Um, but Cabin says, you know what, we don't, just need to do IPAs and sours. We're going to make a Hefeweizen, a Dunkelweizen. They have a Vienna Lager right now, and next week we're doing a. It is a sour, but it's a lacto raspberry Berliner Weiss of all bloody things. It's going to be absolutely amazing. They they love to get just super weird with it and say, you know what? Yes, we'd sell more if we brewed another IPA, but we'd rather brew this other thing that we don't know how we're going to sell yet, but people will buy it anyway. And I absolutely love that. Just completely wild uh, attitude. Just you know what? We'd probably sell more for his IPA, but we're going to make this because it's what we care about. I love that attitude with Cabin. They always surprise me. One thing that I really like uh, that's been happening for the last quite a few years in craft beer is is uh, everybody seems to want to try something new, the next, the next thing. Uh, my favorite breweries are ones that rarely repeat a brew, or if they do, it's just a few cores, and it's a constant string of, of seasonals. Uh, there's a place here in Cranbrook I would recommend anybody check out called the Fire Hall Kitchen and Tap. Uh, they have 
I think around 20 taps and they're constantly rotating uh, about two thirds of them. Uh, kind of like some, some local uh, places in Lethbridge have been doing as well and Calgary for that matter. So uh, I really do quite appreciate that breweries are, are deciding, well, you know, let's do so. There's always something new on the horizon and it just keeps beer drinking fun. In my, in my opinion, uh, life's too short to drink the same old thing over and over again. Is there a cool microbrew scene in Cranbrook? Like, are there some breweries in your area, or? Yeah, there's uh, there's one that's been around a long time here in Cranbrook uh, called Fisher Peak. Uh, it's tied to a restaurant called The Hideout. They've been making a pretty good beer for a long time, and they're starting to do a little bit more seasonal stuff. Um, there's also a brewery in uh, Kimberley called Overtime. I've been there, yeah. Uh, they're, yeah, they're making pretty good beer. Uh, well, one of my favorites is is up in Invermere uh, called Arrowhead. But it uh, and and Fernie, of course, has been uh, quite successful and has has quite a long list of seasonals that come out constantly. So it seems like uh, every little point on the map around here is is uh, well represented in the brewing scene and and uh, especially for how small the population of these towns uh, really is. All right. Well, I'm going to take a break for the tasting before we go to the last beer here. I'm just going to talk to folks about our next couple upcoming tastings real fast. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the wine tasting coming up this Friday. We have Portugal coming up. Uh, we are doing three reds and one white. And if you really love red wine, you should probably get in on this because uh, next Friday we are doing no reds at all. We're going to be doing just whites and rosés. Uh, and next week we are going to be joined by winemaker Ryan Stern. But we'll talk about that later on. This week we have got a Vino Verde. And not just any Vino Verde, probably the best Vino Verde in the store. In fact, definitely the best Vino Verde in the store. Uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. Light, fresh, spritzy couple of different Duro Reds, uh, one at fairly low alcohol down at 13.5. This is an atypical Duro Valley Red because most Duro Valley Reds are big and powerful and fiery. And that's exactly what the HT is. And it's it's a big glass of wine. And then right here in the middle, we have the Carlos, Re uh, Carlos Reynolds Tinto. Uh, this is from Alan Tejano, um, which is not the typical like baking kiln of the Duro Valley. Their wines are, if you want to think of them as being kind of like Portuguese Beaujolais, or Portuguese like Loire Valley Cab Franc, you're not too far away. These tend to be more medium to lighter bodied rather than being inky, inky black. We've got a huge different range of these. Uh, no special guests this week, just me, uh, but we're doing that for wines. And uh, let's talk a little bit. We've hinted at it, but uh, beer next week. We are, of course, doing sours. Uh, the sours, we're going a little bit of a different direction. For the first week ever, we're not doing a $20 tasting. We're doing 25 and that's because we're going to do a Guz. Um, I've been wanting to do something really, really fancy for this for a while. Uh, and there's three beers in particular I want to talk about with this upcoming tasting for sours. We're going to talk about the uh, Eight Wired Cucumber Hippie from New Zealand. Um, we brought this in just because I was looking for a new single beer in a sour that was affordable and great. And then one of these got cracked, I think, by Mike. And I just tasted it and was like, okay, we're doing, we're doing a sour tasting. I have to do this. I have to pour this for people. Everybody has to know how amazing this is. Uh, so that was actually the inspiration for doing sours. I absolutely love this. We're going to jump back into uh, the Florida Weiss Lemons, Lines, and Clementines. I know we did it two weeks ago. I don't care. I absolutely love this beer. Uh, as promised, we're going to do the Kevin Staycation, so the fruited Berliner Weiss with lactose. Uh, I know I said raspberry earlier. I don't actually don't know what the fruit is on this, but it's kind of raspberry colored, so we're going to go with raspberry. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Lambic, the Guz, which if you want to talk about a complicated brewing process that takes years, um, we got this beer in 2013 here in the store. It has an expiry date of uh, November 27th, 2033. So uh, no danger of that one going off anytime soon, and we'll, we'll talk about why. Um, when we talk about you know hops when we're making IPAs, we want them to get here fresh and frozen in an airtight box. We want them as fresh as humanly possible. We want the IPAs to be off the shelf in 30 days. With this, they leave the hops sitting in the, the cellar of the brewery for, for years till they turn all yellow and cheesy and falling apart uh, because they want a very different hop characteristic. So next week, we've got sours. Uh, I am working on a special guest. Haven't picked one exactly yet, or rather, they haven't said yes yet. Adam, if you're watching, say yes. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's our tasting for the next couple of weeks. Let's uh, let's jump straight into the Nocturne Dunkelweiss. Uh, Justin I got asks. A, sorry, go ahead. 
I got to say, Kyle, uh, hearing about all the tastings you guys are doing, I sure miss uh, being in Lethbridge and being part of the uh, Andrew Hilton community because uh, it sounds, sounds awesome, really. Well, if you haven't had half these cool things, Mark, I've got your address already. I'll, I'll build you a little bit of a, a cabin establishment 88 kind of we miss you and you should move back here gift pack. Uh, and I'll just throw that in the post <laughs> to you sometime this week. Uh, you should have that in the next little while. Um, you've You're missed out a lot of cool stuff. You moved at a weird time. Yeah, I did, I guess, but uh, here I am. Uh, Justin asks, is it me or does citrus, especially lemon, go really good with certain wheat beers? Um, yes, it does, but that's a really controversial question because of the tendency of some bars to hang a wedge of lemon on the side of a glass of wheat beer. Um, tell you what, if it's a bad wheat beer, you do with it what you must. But is there not enough citrus in this cabin in particular and oh, with the hologram absolutely. that... You, you don't need any more lemon. More lemon's just more lemon. You, you could just keep throwing lemons at it to the point where it tasted like nothing but lemons. I, I don't know. I don't like lemon served with my wheat beer, and I'm not sniffy enough that I'll send it back if I get served a beer with a piece of lemon on it. But, you know, I'll leave the lemon sitting right on the tabletop, you know, where the server has to clean it up pettily um, because, you know, <laughs> eventually they'll just stop bringing me the lemon because they do get tired of cleaning it up. I think part of that could go back to the fact that uh, in in uh, Belgium, you often serve the whipped beer with a slice of orange. Uh, in Bavaria, that is sacrilege. You just don't put fruit in your beer. You might get kicked out of some bars if you ask for a lemon with your Hefeweizen. No, I agree. Also, Aaron just has dropped everything. He's had the loudest sneezes. I, I'm, I'm rather enjoying the... The real show isn't watching me. The real show is watching Aaron, the Butterfingers, tonight. It's quite something. Um, so I wanted to make sure I got my details right. Um, Hayden from Cabin uh, actually texted me some tasting notes about this nocturne. Um, so same yeast strain as is used in the Rise and Shine. Uh, darker color, more toasted malt, obviously, because that's how you get the darker color. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They used an experimental hop for the, uh, the dry hopping called HBC 472, which he says throws off aromas of bourbon, banana, coconut, and uh, oak. Uh, and that's that's part of why this kind of comes off the way it does. I wouldn't have picked up bourbon until he texted it to me, but yeah, if you told me this was like a, a bourbon barrel aged Uncle Wisen, I wouldn't call you a liar. There's, there's some really interesting toasty, oaky coconut notes here that I wasn't expecting on a typical Uncle Wisen. You know, I was I was having trouble placing it too. As soon as you said bourbon, though, it came to me as well. Uh, and the oak, uh, definitely the coconut. It's interesting that that's hop derived. Yeah, it is because that's not where I would expect. Normally, if I get bourbon and coconut and maybe some vanilla, it's like okay, well, this has to have been oak aged because it's the only way you get those. Um, mm -hmm. The the idea that you could have like a dry hopped stout with this hop, for example, that would show those characteristics, they're going to save a ton of money on wood aging because bourbon barrels are not cheap. Yeah, no doubt. That would be interesting in a, in a stout for sure. So tell us a little bit about Dunkelweizens. It's not a style that we see commonly here. I mean, I've always got them for sale, and there's, there's people who buy them religiously, but they're not something that, you know, people come in and it's like, oh, what are all your new IPAs? And also I need three Dunkelweizens. It's, it's, it's a little bit more of a, I want to say a forgotten style, but maybe a neglected one. Well, Dunkelweiss obviously is, is dark wheat, um, I suppose the comparison between uh, Bavari Bavarian Hellas and Dunkel, uh, Hellas, the word meaning bright, uh, is, is of course a lighter beer, and Dunkel just means dark. So Dunkel Weiss is basically just a, a dark Hefeweizen. So uh, they're using a lot of Munich malt, uh, which is a little bit more roasted, uh, or toasted I suppose is a better word. So you get a little bit more of that Maillard reaction. Maillard reactions is is the browning of, of uh, carbohydrates, uh, much as you have in, in toasted bread as, as the bread starts to brown. So you do get a lot of those toasty notes. Uh, malt forward uh, tends to replace the, the, the wheat characteristic you might have in a, in a Hefeweizen. So basically it's, it's like a banana clove beer with the addition of some some toasted notes, uh, maybe a little bit of chocolate flavor, that sort of thing. And I'll admit it's not a beer that I myself buy all that often. Uh, the other thing I've noticed just kind of going through these, the alcohol level has stayed respectively low uh, or respectfully low on all of these. Um, 
I think when we do these IPA tastings and that, we, we very often creep up towards six and a half, seven percent. I think the highest we've had today is five, four, and most of these aren't even over five. Uh, I, I like that about this tasting because, let's be fair, when we sit down, we do, you know, four pints of 6.5% beer, you get a bit of a blush to your cheeks. It's nice to be something a little lower alcohol. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think all these wheat beers are generally uh, designed, especially the uh, the Bavarian ones, they're designed to be drank in quantity uh, and, and therefore a lower alcohol uh, level is appropriate. So what about you, Mark? What, uh, what's the best beer you've had in the last month? What, uh, what really kind of blew your hat off? Well, that's interesting. Uh, I, I uh, had a beer. I was camping last weekend and, and opened a Guz by the fire. You were talking about Guz earlier with its multi-year process. Guz is a blend of first, second, and third year Lambics. And it was a Guz Boone uh, black label. Uh, so the end so from yeah it was just wonderful it was it was awesome yeah it was i i i'm a sucker for anything giz or anything lambic and and uh, yeah it was probably the best beer i had in the last month nice um now when we talk about wheat beer we talk usually about kind of the summer sessionable things um but there's also been some some big giant beers uh the the wheat wines of the world i i personally i haven't had one that i've really loved is that is that a style with legs, or is that something that whenever you see when you're like, well, I'll try one, but I'm not convinced? I, I suppose as a matter of personal taste myself, I, I, I shy away from bigger beers, uh, which is odd for someone uh, who might qualify as a beer geek. But uh, a wheat wine would similar be similar to a, to a barley wine. And uh, in just to my personal taste there's some barley wines out there that are exceptional and then there's quite a few that are that are just big and and cloying and uh, they do really well with a lot of age and they're the kind of thing that maybe if for me anyways if i want to open one i want to have uh, a couple of friends to share it with sort of thing uh wheat wine i guess is probably a little bit more unusual than barley wine but uh they're definitely out there uh, like I say, they're they're just really big beers, stand up to a lot of age, and uh, I'm not sure that the characteristics of wheat particularly uh, go with such a strong, strong beer, but, you know, some people are really into that sort of thing, and, and bigger is better, so uh, more power to anyone who really enjoys it. Nice. Uh, we'll open it up to questions here. Uh, Todd says thanks to both of us. All the best in Cranbrook. Todd lived there for 10 years. Uh, he does. He does admit that Lethbridge people are nicer. Well, you know, I'm nicer to you, but you know, that's about it. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite of these for, Mark? What do you? What What here really stands out to you as being something you'd be looking to get back for immediately? Uh, right away, it's this uh, this rise and shine from Cabin. I, I do like this, and I I, uh, I guess it's the uh, yeah the hologram is is a is a great wit beer. It's a little drier, so it might be better on a on a hotter day. But just the uh, the juicy hops that jump out of the glass here, this is my favorite on the table for sure. I think that's the same for me. Um, I'm I'm just a sucker for hops, as you well know. Me me and IPA are just the absolute best of friends. And you know, Hayden kind of had my heart in his hands when he said, "Well, it's it's a New England wheat ale," and I was like, "Yes, that's everything I want in the world. Thank you. I'll take 10. Um, I, I love that we're seeing some of these blurrings of lines of styles now. Th there's always been blurrings of lines because, you know, brewers are experimental and some people are just bad brewers. There's always that. I, I love the more experimental styles that we're seeing, you know, on purpose. Um, what have you seen in terms of kind of new emerging styles on, on the beer judge scene? I, I'm sure that you have kind of high level meanings of new styles that people want to submit as these are, you know, in theory going to be new styles that need to be assessed against. What have you started seeing as a beer judge as, you know, styles people want to see that are kind of merging onto the market? Well, I guess the whole, uh, the whole hazy milkshake thing is, is sort of playing itself out. Uh, some of those beers to me are, are absolutely dynamite. Um, I would, I would really like to see personally some more, some more beers in that category that with the juiciness, but maybe not the chalky aspect that you sometimes get from a, from a hazy, uh, beer. So, so let's blur those style lines between hazy and American IPA. 
Um, it's tough to say. Uh, people are starting to, I guess, I suppose, really get into the technical aspects of brewing sour beers properly. Um, but that's, you know, the, the tradition of brewing Lambic has been around forever. So uh, the, to see some of these smaller breweries uh, attempt to do that, and, and home brewers for that matter, I know the guys at Establishment uh, won medals across Canada with a Guz project that they did because they actually made three years of lambic and blended the first second and third year exactly as you would and uh, i know now they're doing a turbid mash program which is quite labor intensive but with the idea that uh, they can replicate uh, some of those lambic beers in belgium that's to me that's just exciting on a homebrew level it's unheard of and uh, the fact that those guys have gone uh, full scale now is is uh, exciting for sure when I hear people talk about um, hazy IPAs versus traditional American IPAs, I, I'm starting to hear very much the East Coast, West Coast parlance of West Coast is your very traditional pine, grapefruit, resin, citrus, and then your East Coast is your lower bitterness, more aromatics, doesn't live as long, hazy, very tropical fruit. Um, is there going to be a day when we talk about East Coast IPAs versus West Coast in a in a strict delineation of saying, you know, Loire Valley wines versus, you know, Bordeaux wines? Or is this always going to be a controversial, touchy subject? Well, I think when you mention blurred lines, those two styles uh, have become blurred because West Coast breweries have started brewing hazy IPAs and, and uh, East Coast breweries have started to try and brew uh west coast style beers so i think personally that east coast and west coast would probably more likely disappear and uh more individual niche styles of ipa are going to emerge uh you know hazy took off as a big craze and and new england of course calling it new england is uh just speaking about where the style may have originated because they're being brewed all across the uh continent right now but we had a really I personally interesting conversation think... about that uh, with the guys from uh, 88, actually. And uh, they actually had a flat, a heady topper, I think they said, when they were actually kind of starting to brew Night Gallery and working on that. And they had a very clear goal in mind. And I think everybody's kind of going right after heady topper with that style and then building on it from there. Yeah, that's certainly one of the ones that started the 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 genre. Uh, I think some breweries have done it very well. And... My personal taste is some breweries haven't. So uh, when I have one that's really good, it's it's hard to beat, that's for sure. Now, to me, I, I've never really been 100% clear on the difference between a hazy IPA and a milkshake IPA. Uh, and, Julie, I do see your question. I'll get to that in a second. But, um, Mark, as a BJCP beer judge, define for me a milkshake IPA. What separates that from all the other styles? Well, so... The BJCP uh, doesn't necessarily define those, but my understanding of uh, being they're fairly new styles, but uh, my understanding is a milkshake IPA is a hazy IPA with uh, the addition of lactose. So um, basically lactose is an unfermentable sugar. Uh, you'd know it from as a milk sugar and it adds a sweetness. So uh, a milkshake IPA, uh, and then often they put some kind of fruit in there as well so the, the addition of lactose gives it a sweetness that you might not find as much of in a hazy ipa but they're both very similar styles uh <clears throat> julie asks uh is anyone in alberta doing a white ipa i've had a few by ontario breweries and they're mighty tasty uh, i agree with you and while cabin would not call this a white ipa i actually would i think that's hoppy enough to qualify uh, i think the line between a New England Hefeweizen and a white IPA is um, kind of non-existent. It's a uh, calling it a you know ketchup versus catsup sort of question. Um, but in reality, um, white IPAs, at least in a retail perspective, kind of had their day about six years ago. Uh, I remember when Deschutes first came into the market, um, they had a white IPA called Chainbreaker. And we were selling, no lie, three to four flats a week a Chainbreaker in six-pack bottles. Hey, remember when beer came in six pack bottles and not four packs of tall cans? Um, and yeah, like white IPA was huge five, six years ago. It was all we could sell. And then it slowly kind of died off. I think this might be kind of the, the, the beginning of a new trend, I, I hope, because I really liked white IPAs. 
Now, the one thing I will say is white IPAs tended to be more Belgian wit focused on the yeast side or American wheat on the uh, yeast side and then have the, the hops added. This is, to me, quite unique in the sense that it's German Hefeweizen, uh, despite being cloudy and wheaty, and then having the, the hops on top. Uh, what about you, Mark? White IPAs, thing of the past, or still going? Well, I know the local brewery here in Cranbrook's making one. It's pretty good. Uh, you're absolutely right. White IPA usually is more like the Belgian style, so it includes typically what includes the coriander and the uh, orange peel. But I suppose hazy IPA kind of took right off where where white IPA had left it. And uh, I think you're right. This uh, with the Hefeweizen yeast is is adding quite a bit of dimension to it. Uh, you know, if they push the hops in this and called it a I, I don't know what you call it, a Hefeweizen IPA or, or uh, a Weiss PA, whatever you want to call it. I, I like this beer a lot. I think that uh, this is one they should uh, brew again. This is their second year with this one. Uh, it's definitely only been summers only, and yeah, I, I really groove on this. I think this is a lot of fun. Apparently Stronghold out in Fort McLeod is making a cool, really cool white IPA. I should actually give that a shot. Uh, I have reached <laughs> out to Stronghold. We don't have their cans yet, but uh, we will soon. Speaking of new stuff, I'm going back up to Calgary this uh, Saturday. Uh, I haven't heard back from Cabin on what I'm getting from them. If anything, I know they're canning a new IPA this Monday, so not this Saturday, potentially next Saturday. Fingers crossed, new single hop IPA from them. Uh, from establishment, nothing new, but we're getting top-ups of uh, Mellow Gold, uh, Afternoon Delight, Jam Rock, and Skyrocket. Uh, and then 88, this is the exciting one, in addition to top-ups of Ring Pop and the rest, uh, we are getting the Fruity Pebbles in four packs, which is their double dry hopped lacto-fruited milkshake IPA, which I sound like I'm being dismissive, but it is actually absolutely amazing. It really is very fruity and cereal grain-ish and very, very fun. Um, I just I don't like listing that really long name. They should just call it Fruity Pebbles and stop telling people what's actually in it because it's a it's a laundry <laughs> list of styles. Uh, I, I like it just as Fruity Pebbles. Uh, and then the beer that after the, along with the hologram, I shouldn't say after, but along with the hologram, the very first time I was there that I really, really liked from them, uh, they have a very, very classic West Coast double IPA, which uh, to me has always been very kind of Pliny the Elder-ish uh, in the doubled air. Uh, high alcohol, unapologetically West Coast, refresh, very old fashioned in the best possible way. And when I say old fashioned, I say like 2008 old fashioned in the sense of the high point of Lagunitas and Russian River and Stone, where that, that very pale, clear, super snappy, grapefruity West Coast IPA was at the absolute pinnacle of its popularity. Not old fashioned like, you know, 1995 Brewster's where it's all sticky and sweet. Um, Brewster's has gotten spectacularly better, by the way, but Brewster's had a bit of a low point in the mid 90s, in my opinion. Um, but those are all coming in on Saturday. They'll be on the show Sunday. Uh, Scotty Farrell, what's the wine section this weekend and next week's beer taste? Um, back up the video, Scotty, because we did actually promo those right after the, uh, the Rise and Shine. But in short, the wine tasting is Portugal, one white and three red. Uh, and this upcoming uh, beer tasting this coming Wednesday is Sour Ales. So we have a Berliner Weiss, a Lambic, a uh, cucumber Berliner Weiss, and then we are revisiting the Blind Men Florida Weiss, uh, Lemons, Limes, and Clementines. Uh, and wow, the, the comment section already answered that before I could even get to it. Thank you, Todd and Nicole. Well, I think at 50 minutes, we are going to wrap up the formal portion of the tasting. Uh, if any of you have questions for me or for Mark, feel free to hit us up. Otherwise, we're going to just kind of talk beer and if you guys have questions hit us up um but yeah thank you all very much for tuning in uh mark what's uh what's interesting in beer to you right now what's the new trend that you're all about in beer well i kind of like uh these experimental hops that are kicking about um the new zealand style you know pale ale pilsner uh it's it's just uh, there's such a world of hops out there. I guess it's really been expanding. At uh, sorry, I'm getting buzzed by hummingbirds here. Um, really expanding uh, exponentially. It seems like there's always something new to try in the world of hops. So 
I think that hoppy beers are uh, going to keep, ex- you know, there'll always be something new. And uh, I'm I'm still a sucker for sours, so I like to see that potentially some of some of these uh, breweries are moving away from the easy to brew, easy to handle kettle sours and starting to make some real wild ales. So uh, that's that's what's exciting to me for sure. I'm not kettle soured out yet, but for me, I think it's the um, it's the everything old is new again style. I think people are. I don't think East Coast IPAs or hazy IPAs or New England IPAs, whatever you want to call them, I don't think they've jumped the shark yet because there's still so much more they can do. But I, I'm always kind of loving the idea of West Coast IPAs almost becoming like counterculture or it almost being cheeky to go back to the West Coast. I'm loving some of the new West Coast or um, 88 has this East meets West idea IPA called Wave Pool. Um, I'm loving this this return to the West Coast with lessons learned for New England IPAs, and I'm really loving getting that. I I, I couldn't agree more. The uh, the idea that West Coast, like you say, uh, could use some of the the juiciness that you you found in some of the the hazy East Coast IPAs is uh, is exciting. I've always really liked an IPA that was session strength and gravity but absolutely hopped over the top uh just because it's a session ipa doesn't mean it can't be 80 plus ibus in my opinion um that's a personal taste of mine sometimes uh a six and a half seven percent american style ipa can be a little bit too much so uh let's see some more four and a half percent uh that aren't weak in the hops uh that would be uh something i'd like to see come come down the pipe so would I. Uh, Justin asks, any chance on getting summer saturation from Cabin? Um, so the story on that is I went up to Calgary just as COVID broke, and we weren't sure if we were even going to be allowed to be open like after the weekend. Uh, but I committed to eight fights of this uh, summer saturation. I said, well, i got to go up. I've, I've committed to it. I'm married to it. I have to get it. And I brought it down, and it was exactly what you said, 4.5%, and it was stunning. It was I don't want to say the best beer cabins ever brewed, but it was the best beer cabins ever brewed. Uh, and I don't think that uh, opinion is unique to me. It's been very popular among everybody because they've done lots of versions of saturation there. It's super saturation, regular saturation, which they did for Stampede last year. They did super duper saturation for Christmas. But we picked up that summer saturation right when COVID broke at the start of March. We sold out in about a week. And I have had, I swear, three times a week at least since then, people coming and looking for summer sat. Never mind that the first batch would be cooked by now. It'd be, it'd be old. But I really got to think that, A, they brew that in March, calling it summer saturation. It's not even summer yet. They have to brew it for summer. It's called summer saturation. But, uh, Justin, there are a lot of people, me, you, half of Calgary, everybody, uh, that are just getting after them about summer saturation. I think it's the same situation with establishment with uh, Jamrock, where it was just a one-time seasonal, and 88 with Ring Pop. I think that the uh, I think the pressure on Cabin with summer saturation is mounting. Um, I'd be surprised if that didn't come back for summer, but like we, Mike and I talked about earlier, like Cabin doesn't bend to market trends as much as other breweries like what would it be super easy for them to do right now like they could do a dry hop sour and a summer saturation and they would just sell out what did they do instead they did a dunkel wise and a dry hopped heffa and they did a vienna lager and a lacto berliner because that's what they wanted to make cabin's very particular about what they make and i absolutely love the fact that what i expect is never what they make and i love that they're full of surprises it's sometimes damn frustrating though (laughs) So, yeah, I, I absolutely love them. But if it was any other brewery, I'd say, yes, summer saturation is definitely coming. Cabin will brew it if they bloody well feel like it, and I kind of love them for it. Uh, any other questions we got? Um, not yet. But uh, I'll ask you this, Mark. Uh, what's kind of the beer scene feeling like in BC? Like here, it's all about kettle sours. It's all about New England IPAs. Is there any variation on that in BC right now, or is that basically what you're seeing too? It seems to be uh, the, definitely the New England IPA thing is has been big. Uh, a lot of what drives beer culture in British Columbia, I think, is what's happening in in and around Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver's seen a big explosion of breweries, uh, much like Calgary, but maybe just a little bit uh, in advance time-wise of of uh, the timeline there. So, 
Uh, what's happening in the East Kootenays is that small regional breweries are popping up, and it, for the most part, it's people who really appreciate good beer uh, as the reason why they're opening a brewery. There's nothing worse than someone who opens a brewery with a bunch of extra money lying around because they think it's going to be a good business venture. Uh, the best kind of brewers are the ones who really have a love and a passion for, for brewing. So. Uh, some small little town breweries are opening up out here and excited to see uh, what they're going to be able to bring forward. Um, of course, it's a little bit more rural feel here in the in the East Kootenay. So like I say, uh, BC beer culture is generally driven by the Vancouver market and big, big into that uh, sour beer and uh, East Coast IPA trend still. Have you gotten out to Vancouver lately? Uh, I was. I was in Vancouver in February. Uh, I forget all the breweries we went to. Um, it was, I guess, right before COVID sort of broke. But, uh, oh, it escapes me. There was one we went to that was unreal. Um, but uh, I'd have to look back in my notes to, to remember exactly what brewery it was. No, uh, no it we've was all one... had nights like that, yes. Lupolo. Lupolo? That's what it was. Well, I yeah, already like really the name, enjoyed. yeah. Uh, doing a lot of sours, uh, if I remember, if that's the, the one I'm thinking of anyways, uh, doing a lot of sours, wild ales, uh, it was quite exciting. Uh, and then, uh, had the opportunity to, uh, cruise through Seattle, uh, hit up some breweries down there too. So the, the sour beer scene is alive and well, and, uh, that's exciting to me, but, uh, definitely there's way too many breweries to hit in one visit in Vancouver. So. Uh, it's a multiple multiple day, if not week trip, if you wanted to uh, really put your put your work in. Awesome. Well, I think the questions have effectively dried up, and I think we are going to call her there at about an hour, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time. It was a pleasure. I, I appreciate you having me. Like I say, uh, you know, really appreciate Andrew Hilton and, and uh, always have. I definitely miss you guys, so uh, keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you through at some point in the future. Uh, for Absolutely the rest, will, yeah. For the rest of us, uh, thank you very much, folks. We will see you out for sour beer next week. Uh, we are hoping to have a guest speaker, but nothing booked down yet. But uh, thank you again to Mark Whitehead. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you in a week. For Andrew Hilton, Wanted Spirits, I'm Kyle, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks again, Kyle. Cheers, Mark. Well, I am, yeah.